Cheers. <laughs> Should have dressed in a tuxedo. Episode 400, look out. All right. Y'all ready? Yep. Sure. Here goes that intro. Uh, one star. <laughs> the podcast first got started when our good friend, the Godfather Jack, threw the question out, hey, you guys want to start a show? And we were like, yeah, absolutely, we do. He brought the idea that I was like, hey, you know, we're already meeting more than once a week and watching dumb horror movies, sometimes good horror movies and having really fun conversations about them. Why don't we just record them, put them out on a podcast, and if anybody listens, great. And we all loved that idea. We thought that was, you know, just a way of formalizing what we were already doing in some small way. Not very formal, but it was formal enough to where it sort of gave us a purpose in doing it and lit a fire under our asses to keep doing it. We bought a room mic and we set it in the middle of the room. We all gathered around it after watching a movie and just started talking like we always did. And that was the beginnings of the show. It was about to be the big boom, the big renaissance, you know, where suddenly everybody and their mother had a podcast and we were one of them. So from the very beginning, we did a round robin style. And in that way, we had a lot of variety. Also, we used to watch the movie before casting all together in the early days. And I think that had a big impact as well. It really was about friends kind of getting together, joking around during the movie, during the cast. It was very loose. It was a lot of fun, very chaotic. So yeah, that first 62 episodes was largely the three current hosts, myself, Justin, Rob, um, and then Jack, the Godfather, his brother, Ross, Rickety, as we called him at the time, and still occasionally. Drew, who we might recognize as the resident serial killer of the group, and uh, at times Brad, who kind of came in towards the end almost from guest to full-time podcaster with us. We didn't have any sort of like outline or, or thoughts about how we wanted the show to, you know, progress over the conversation. We had, you know, five, six, even like seven people talking about this movie at one time. And it just like was very hectic. The audio quality was pretty low on those first 62 shows. One of the shows that sticks out kind of in my mind was when we did Cabin in the Woods. And that time our friend Alex joined in who absolutely hated horror movies. And in those early days, it really was a very open door kind of policy. And that's really more or less how it started is, you know, run and gun, just doing what we can to make it work and then just writing it. And the way that we would record those early episodes was laughable and basically unlistenable now. It was a mess. And uh, I look back and think how unlistenable it is, but it's still like a lot of fun to think about. And it's more or less like hanging out with your buddies. And that's what we wanted this podcast to feel like. So we kind of intentionally kept it open like that while we figured out how to add structure to a structureless group of buddies just hanging out and shooting the shit. So that's more or less how that worked. I haven't listened to those episodes in a really long time, but I think it really set the foundation for having a show that really was about friends getting together and just kind of talking about something that we love together, just spending time together. And if nothing else, despite their quality, I think that's what those first early episodes really did for the podcast, is kind of set that friendly foundation. Red Come on. Come on. You know this. All right. Rant. So cool. Yeah, cool story. So personally to like 
report it and then to see like somebody else reported the same thing you'd be like okay well like at least i have that to like kind of hang my hat on like for for your own personal sanity you know and we gotta know uh if you got a special package tonight so we have been uh, tracking bob's blu-ray purchases over the past few months bob Bob. last this is the last week of october bob the last numbers we're gonna count you ended at 15 and tonight before our podcast you are telling us that you were so many expecting a vinegar syndrome package to be delivered a vincent pack tonight (laughs) bob Tell us Bob. in the past week how <laughs> the, what's the Vincent pack, Rob? Fuck. <laughs> Holy I, shit. YouTube exclusive. Yeah, was, Damn. Yeah. Rob, how many Blu-rays have you purchased in the past week? Are you gonna shatter your record? You have never hit 20. We're eager to know. Rob is expecting November. a vinegar syndrome package. So not just like not just one movie this in is, an envelope. He's expecting a package. This is like buy, this is expecting the Lord Jesus syndrome. Christ to come down and bless you as a DVD <laughs> subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's okay. happening. <laughs> oh, you, Randy. You can deny it all you want, non believer, but I'm telling you. Ran- Red Wait, Stag Randy has. Did you drink that whole bottle of this cast, Randy? I don't need to tell you that. I think you did. I think he started with. I think he opened a bottle of Red Stag and has since finished it. Holy I did not God. open a bottle of Red Stag. <laughs> I think you did, Red Stag Randy. I think you did. <laughs> Jesus. Your Christ. beliefs are non withstanding. <laughs> I can't. I can't fucking handle Well, that's this. been a Halloween extravaganza. <laughs> <laughs> I We've been doing this for like the- three and a half hours. What do I give a shit? I'm uh, drinking. <laughs> I'm drinking. So in my mind, I kind of see the show as existing in four different kinds of iterations. The first one being the first 62 episodes, of course. Completely different format, very loose, very chaotic. The way we recorded, that was just very distinct. The podcast has changed significantly since we started it. We did the first 62 shows back to back, and we took maybe a four-month hiatus Towards the end of that, some of the guys were asking, like, if we're going to bring the show back, if we were going to start doing it again, kind of missed meeting weekly and, and having our little uh, movie watch parties. So, you know, we had a conversation about things that we wanted to change or improve upon. If we were going to bring the show back and do it um, for a longer time, we just wanted it to be of a, a, a higher quality than what we were doing before. And after those first 62 episodes, with some of the interest waning amongst the guys, we sort of, you know, collected on ourselves and we're like, okay, how do we how do we make this a lot more manageable for ourselves? The second one I see is when we did the kind of reboot after that one. And in that, I kind of include the episodes that we did with Cesar because they kind of blended together. So while I do think Cesar added a very fresh perspective and a unique style to the show. I kind of lumped those all together because in the early days of that reboot, we were kind of rotating through some hosts anyways. Uh, Rickety was one of the main hosts. Um, Drew was one of the main hosts when he could make it. But then ultimately I landed with the three of us and Cesar. We sat around a table and uh, had the conversations and we actually had an outline of how we wanted that conversation to flow. We introduced some new segments. We did our Rotten Tomatoes segment, our trivia news, and then we eventually developed the Cooter of the Week, you know, which is a bit of an inside joke on the podcast. So over the years, we sort of started getting these segments together and started, you know, putting structure to things a little bit, sort of feel it. We kind of did an intentional loose format to begin with and then tightened things up just sort of along the edges, not too tight, but we wanted to find what felt comfortable for us. And what was comfortable for us was a bunch of like stupid jokey segments, us, you know, sort of learning how to not talk over each other, learning how, when to say when in terms of number of guests 
and how to mic ourselves properly and get the proper equipment for what we were doing. And really the third iteration that I see is once Cesar left and we made a conscious decision to just keep it me, Rob, and Andy. Because in that time, we really focused on kind of polishing the show as well and really honing it in, focusing on our friendship and making that a vital part of the show going forward. We started with a very big crew and over the years, you know, personnel has changed substantially. We've scaled some things down, like our number of hosts, you know, like we kind of all came to an agreement that, you know, some people, you know, wanted to do this every week and some people just couldn't commit to it. And as much as it, you know, sucked to have to lose a bunch of people, it actually worked largely to our benefit as in terms of listenability because you're not, you don't have so many competing voices. There's just a lot of like things that, like of that nature that you have to just sort of barrel through if you're doing things very DIY the way we have always done them. We just sort of continued moving and learning. I started adding bumps and we started adding musical interludes. We also did our How to Save a Life segment where I get berated for buying all these damn movies behind me. And so the fourth iteration that I kind of see is the introduction of the Patreon and the You Pick the Flick, that really put our listeners in control through a lot of our show. So a majority of the shows that we talk about in a year have some sort of influence from our Patreon supporters. And that could be through the monthly voting poll or the You Pick the Flick. And so having our listeners so involved in that way really changes the show because we can't even choose movies really anymore. You know, they have the control of what they want to hear us talk about. And I think that that in my mind is kind of the fourth iteration of the show is the introduction of essentially our listeners as the fourth kind of cast member in that way. We introduced our voicemail segment, uh, which has been really a, a great way to get our listeners more involved in the show. I think it's always great hearing from people across the world, really. They call in and, and you know answer our questions, ask us questions. It's just like a really great way to uh, engage with people who are listening to the show. It's nice to know that we're not just speaking into a void as well. As things have grown, you know, since we've gotten past those first 62 episodes and sort of re-implemented things, added a Patreon to the mix, we now have, you know, people pick for us. People pick movies for us. We don't have a ton of control over what those movies are, which adds to even more diversity in, in films that we watch. It's not always to our benefit. And that's more or less the track that we've run ever since is just trying to tighten things without you know making them um, immovable somehow so i think we've improved our audio quality i think we've built out some like really neat original segments uh, to our show and i think we've also just like tried to include our listeners as best we can those are probably the main ways the show's involved over time rob in our slack channel you gotta name the main tag fucking posers Fucking <laughs> are you a I real straight chilling crew are you hard with us <laughs> are, you are you just a... <laughs> do you've got a hard on for us oh, if you don't have if you're not hard with us then you ain't with us baby you just some fucking poser <laughs> you fucking live are dick, you hard if you were really hard with us, you'd jerk off on camera for us. <laughs> Phrasing. Go to youtube.com backslash straight chilling to see Andy. Oh. Just yep. wieners. Just all wieners. <laughs> My role in the podcast is, I think, primarily just to keep everybody together and sort of on track. I think about the overall flow of the show, and I try to be very aware of where the conversation is heading. And also, I try to avoid the uh, having some sort of like cyclical uh, conversation or feel. Um, I try to just like be aware of things that bother me about other podcasts when I listen to them, and avoid having that happen on our show. So I think I kind of 
help guide the conversation and just make sure that everybody's on track and heading in the same direction, I guess. That's kind of, I think, my primary role in the show. If I can throw in any, like, talking points or, you know, pose a question that would lead to a more enriched discussion on the movie, I'll obviously try and do that. I think we all do that, though. That's not really specific to me. I guess my, my main role is just, like, keeping the wheels on the track. So, I mean, I'm a co-host, obviously. I've been a co-host since the beginning. Um, I am the in-house graphic designer, so I do all the visual ephemera and the logo and everything else sort of keep that bearishly locked down. But my favorite role as an on, on the air personality, if you want to call it that, is to sort of be a pain in Rob's ass. And I mean that in the sense that he brings a lot of structure to the podcast. He tries to keep the trains moving, tries to keep them on time, and you know tries to keep you know digressions to a minimum. And I try to derail all of those things. I like to bring a chaotic energy. I use the absolutely ridiculous morning zoo style sound bumps just to infuse a little bit of silliness into things. You know, at the time that we started this, my favorite podcast was Harmontown, and still probably is, honestly. And I was watching a lot of the Chris Gethard show, both very, you know, open-ended, you know, digression-heavy shows that did not focus heavily on anything, really, and just sort of flew by the seat of their pants. And that's the aesthetic I wanted to bring to things. I didn't want it to be completely formless because to Rob's credit, him doing that is what, you know, makes us seem anything like professionals, which is a mistake on anybody's part. But still, that's what gives us the illusion of professionality. So undercutting that and bringing that chaos and bringing that improvisational edge to things is something that I really love to do. I think Rob loves it even if he says he hates it. And, you know, to me, I think that's really valuable. That's sort of one of the things that helps keeps us, you know, somewhat relatable to people because we aren't NPR here. We are just a group of assholes. So I kind of see myself as a bit of the lovable scam. Uh, maybe the little bit of extra spice that goes into our podcast. When I think about the overall structure of the podcast, I definitely see Robbie as, you know, kind of the leader the structure, if you will. He really keeps us on track. He really pushes the good discussion topics, make sure time is going well. And he does a ton of stuff behind the scenes as well. And he truly is kind of like our leader. When I think about Andy, I think Andy is kind of like the backbone. He really keeps us grounded in a very light kind of way. And he always has really great insight into the movies. And in that way, those two really carry a lot of the weight of the show. So if there's anything particularly unique that I bring, I think it's a little bit of the ridiculousness. I really try to treat the podcast as if we are hanging out together, which means kind of razzing everyone, giving everyone a ton of shit. I really try to push the crazy catchphrases that we have, the hashtag hard with us, the half star for the yabos, things like that. I definitely think one of my main goals is to just kind of keep everyone laughing and having a good time and to really push that levity into our podcast. And uh, beyond the door at three. So, <laughs> Bob, <laughs> on November 4th, we're going to start the month up <laughs> with 12. Hang oh, on. wait. Oh. oh, shit. Is there another you, stack? <laughs> you want to see what I bought when I was at Spooky Empire? Oh, my God! <laughs> Bob, Holy was that God. just your package that you were anticipating last Rob. week? Rob, the jet ski, Maybe. Rob. Think of the oh jet ski. Oh, my God! <laughs> so, Bob would have ended October with 29. Bob has a separate stack. The bloodbath oh has hit God. us. The bloodbath oh has uh, hit us. Bob. What a twist. What a fucking We're twist. <laughs> Part two. Hit us, Bob. Ready? Spooky YouTube Empire. Exclusive. One, two, Jesus. three, four, five, six. I can't <laughs> count. I can't count fast enough. I can't count fast <laughs> There's still so fucking... many. Oh, my God. In Four days, Bob has shattered his record. Is that 17? Is that 17 in your hand right now? Oh, I can't count. I can't count fast. Uh, oh, 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 man. Uh, how many is that, Bob? Let me count. Oh, oh my God.
Oh my god. Bob has never hit twenty yeah, in a month. 17. Oh my god, we're at twenty nine. The branding of the podcast started um, as an absolute requisite. Not just because I'm a designer and that's what I do for a living and I feel like I have to do that anyway, but also because we could not put a podcast into the world that didn't even have an image. At, and, you know, a reminder that at this time when we were still researching how to distribute, we didn't even have a name. You know, I had to like, we went through lists of names. I think I, think I came up with Street Chilling. Double check the records on that. But, you know, eventually we did settle on that being the name, and I was like, okay, well, I gotta knock out this image. I gotta make some sort of loco so that I can, you know, start distributing these episodes we've already got backlogged. So I put that first logo together in an afternoon, sitting at the Casbah Cafe in Jacksonville, Florida, smoking a hookah and feverishly trying to put together this insane little logo that is absolutely like, it uses the classic black, white, red color scheme that, you know, is pretty overused in fairness in the horror realm and using sort of like splatter text, custom text and things like that. You know, it's fine. <laughs> I'm glad that people liked it. I'm glad the crew liked it, but it was a means to an end at the time. And uh, when we, uh, you know, restarted the podcast after episode 62, I just sort of like started trying to put together way more ephemera. I put together the website, started trying to put together a visual language for that. But over time, it grew pretty stale in my opinion. And then we fully rebranded on episode 300, where I started pulling from things like, you know, occult stuff, like just general occult imagery, nothing very specific, but stuff that, you know, sort of pulls out in the mind demonic possession, that sort of thing. Something that I, sort of my talking point to myself when I was redesigning everything was, I want this logo to look like something that you could see on a 1970s pulp horror public publication logo. Something that you could see on the bind of a weathered pulp novel about a slasher. That was sort of my going rate right on that. And I really enjoyed making that. I really enjoyed sort of like, you know, expanding the color palette, sort of looking at different ways to get across the horror aesthetic that wasn't just the distressed typeface look. So a little inside baseball maybe, but yeah, that, that was my logic. Well, there's like three different iterations of the theme for this show. Uh, the first one I made about eight years ago and dubstep was a very popular genre. I was really into electronic music, listening to it and creating it. And Justin and I had even made a couple like hip hop albums together. And I work on Ableton Live is uh, my digital audio workspace. So I threw together a theme for us and I wanted it to start off very simple with this creepy little piano lick to sort of indicate that, you know, the genre we're talking about, horror movies, and kind of reflect some old uh, horror movie scores, you know, very minor, uh, slow and creepy. And then it swells into this sort of upbeat, dancey, dubstep kind of thing. And I thought that would be kind of a good way to reflect our personalities in a way. So, you know, you kind of get the, the creepy, minor piano stuff for the horror, the, the topic of discussion, and then you get the sort of upbeat, dancey stuff, you know, because we're a bunch of idiots making, you know, fart jokes and stuff. So it sort of reflects us, I think. We updated it for episode 300, which was the same time uh, Andy changed our branding. So we kind of wanted to roll out a new theme to go along with it. I guess the, the biggest difference with this version is that I upped the tempo a little bit. I also uh, uh, kind of got rid of the, the wubby dubstep sort of stuff and um, was going for more of a synth wave kind of thing. This is a genre that's very popular now and is also influenced by early John Carpenter scores. So I thought it made sense to kind of go for a synth wave vibe. And I also just really enjoy listening to Synthwave. I think it's kind of a neat sound. We, uh, we did change one of the lyrics. Um, all the lyrics are the same except for one line in the original theme. Uh, Justin says, five cold villains on the mic got you reeling. And we updated that to three cold villains because there used to be five hosts and now there are three and has been for years. So anybody listening to the intro is probably very confused wondering where the hell the other two hosts have been. And the only other iteration of the theme that exists is the beginning of episode 300. We were doing this whole bit about Andy, Justin and I, we finally bought a straight chilling jet ski and we take it out for a spin and we crash 
and die and go to hell. And it's this whole ridiculous thing we were doing. So we wanted to open up episode 300, which was a memorial to us, very slow. So there's this sort of string quartet version of the theme that opens that show. And those are really, those are the three versions of the theme. Each year, I really make it a focus of mine to introduce something new and different to the podcast, just to kind of mix things up. So back in the day, we did a lot more things through our website. I used to do Music Mondays, where essentially I would write articles or talk about horror music videos on YouTube and kind of bring that element into, you know, not just covering horror movies and adding a new kind of element. One of my absolute favorite segments was the Bracket of Blood, which was a ton of work and absolutely huge. It lasted like three or four months. We did a ton of prep beforehand, but it was so much fun and unique playing this game based around horror movies and seeing what you know our listeners thought and getting them involved and having special mini episodes. A lot of the segments and extra content has come through the YouTube page though over the years. Um, during that time, I've done some horror video game reviews and playthroughs. That's been a ton of fun getting to introduce that element, which is something that affected me as a kid as well. You know, playing Resident Evils, Bioshocks, and things like that. I really love adding any kind of element that's not just focused on horror movies. We've done some tier list as well, some top five list. And recently we got to add a new thing, which is really cool because it's a passion of Bob's, which is super unique. And it's these horror tiki cocktails and just things like that, that just show the far reaching elements of horror and kind of like everything that it can be involved in. I love exploring those different elements and creating new kind of segments out of it to keep the podcast as fresh as possible throughout the years. Also, there's like, there's, it implies like he's been living under the house in the second dungeon, uh, which is essentially just the sewer system, I guess. But he's yes. like eating rat to survive. There's there's one rat that's literally eaten in half. It's like it's like it's like somebody took a cartoon bite out of a rat. Yeah. And then somebody <laughs> touches the rat. Yeah. <laughs> Like, oh, it's just a prop. It's just a prop. And then the prop squeals. And she goes, oh, no, it's not a prop. But it's a prop. It is a prop. Um, oh, shit. Oh, that's in the second dungeon. And then, how much, how much money you got to be pulling in to have two torture dungeons moves. in your house? <laughs> it moves. It's bitten in half. Oh, in that's like danger tainment, so, baby. Like it's still alive. Oh, can we get to Busta now? Like, so much, yeah, so much. Hugest, the hugest bite out of this <laughs> rat. Like, <what's> <laughs> I want to. Wow. Uh, Juice has lost hinges today. It's We're going to blame that the, on, I on, on the antibiotics. The most, I think it's the most ridiculous thing that's moved. <laughs> really? So the podcast community that we have built almost kind of like snuck up and bit us. I remember the first time I think somebody hit us up and was like, hey, I want to be on your show. I believe it was Nicole. She was living uh, in Orlando, around the Orlando area, and she drove up to Jacksonville to sit in on the show with us a couple times. And that was sort of like our first uh, experience with like, okay, wow, we, we really are like reaching people and they do want to engage in a way that, that we would like them to. I was convinced that there was nobody listening to us and that whatever downloads we had were from bots. But as it turned out, we started getting, you know, some positive reviews on iTunes and on, you know, whatever else I guess we were on at that time. We started getting engagement on Twitter or on Facebook. Not a lot, still not a lot, but you know, we started seeing people be like, hey, liked your episode, good thoughts on this, and then, quickly 
came the negative reviews, and um, there are significantly less of those. The fact that anybody listened and cared enough to review positively or negatively, it still trips me up. It's crazy to think that anybody would care enough about what we have to say as non-experts just, you know, shooting the shit with each other. Since then, uh, we've also met Anthony. He's become a really great friend over the years. He's sat in on our podcast and some of uh, some of his other friends, people that work for him and his website, have also been on the show. He, he did one of our live shows with us too, actually, uh, when we did a screening of Sleepaway Camp at Sunray Cinema. He was there for that. So if you talk to anyone within the straight chilling circle, I think they will probably mention the Slack community. And I think that's where our community really kind of took hold and grew together. We've got a really thriving Slack community. We talk on there every day about, you know, horror movies, of course, but also just about like our lives, uh, people, you know, getting married having kids, uh, the ups and the downs. We have like a health and fitness channel and we've trade recipes. I mean, really just engage in a way that's not just about the movies we're talking about every week. It's, it's very personal and like there's a lot of friendships that have been built on there. At this point, we have like four or five different podcasts that have spawned just from people in the Slack meeting each other in the Slack talking about things that they enjoy in common or just getting together, never met each other in real life, only met through our Slack community. And that is incredible. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah, and so as time has worn on, we've actually started feeding back off of our community. They've, you know, engaged with us and we can just sort of like ask questions and people will answer them. You know, people uh, will join our Patreon, donate money to us, money. I don't know why, but they do. And in return, they get to basically pick films for us. You know, these are things that, you know, we've implemented over time to sort of increase that community engagement and sort of keep ourselves kind of in this place of being beholden to others and therefore creating a better product. <laughs> you know, we, we didn't set out to make a product when we started this podcast, but the fact that people are listening and they're engaging with it and are actively a part of it makes us sort of beholden to them in some way, and it makes us better at this hobby that we put together for ourselves. It was always a goal of mine to, to try and take our conversation amongst friends and open that conversation up and have other people weigh in and uh, you know not just be us talking into a void, but hopefully find people with common interests and, and build a community over time. And we've been really fortunate that we've been able to do that with some amazing people. We have a ton of great, you know, grassroots supporters um, that are our buddies, our friends from Jacksonville, um, but also globally too. I mean, we've had people from Australia, South Korea, Canada, Sweden, Germany, all kinds of places. And to see that community grow globally is absolutely incredible and to think that all of that came out of the small corner of jacksonville and just has kind of like spread out that's absolutely incredible to me and something that i really really cherish about the podcast you know i'm happy about it i'm thrilled about it and the the way that it's grown since the sort of those early you know interactions with the public we have so many people now regularly engaging with us, regularly, you know, messaging me and emailing or whatever, talking in Slack. And it's not just me, obviously, it's like the whole crew and everybody with each other. It's a, it really is like in a broad community at this point. And the, that, that is truly unbelievable to me. I don't, I don't know, you know, what it is about us making dick and fart jokes that appeals to people, but I guess there is something universal about that language vampire that makes kind of like but i'm not defending i don't want to defend this movie i don't want to defend this so movie. he's the only perfect yet, vampire i don't know it it makes he him can shape very also i hate i hate how he references he's like have you heard of stroker's novel about stroker's me it's like Stoker's Bitch, you've fable. been asleep Strokers. for like centuries. <laughs> Stroker, I'd be stroking. I'd be stroking. Dude, I'd be stroking. I am always stroking. <laughs> 
Have you heard Stroken's fable? Stroken. Have you heard? Stroken. Stroken. I fucking love that. Brom Stroken. Oh shit. Dude, this is what happens when you're three soldiers. Brom Stroker's Dracula. That is a movie. Dude, that is a porn. Sense? That is a porn have somewhere. You... That is. Have yes, you heard is. Stroken's novel about me, bitch? <laughs> Stroken wrote a few words about me and my fable. Oh, Bram shit. Stroken, baby. Bram <laughs> Slam Stroken's Dracula. Slam. Slam. <laughs> okay, we've gone. We've gone. Yeah. Gone off the rails. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so. I have a lot of really great memories over the years doing the show with, you know, some of my best friends. I think I definitely, the live shows stick out in my head as being some, some of my favorite moments. We did a couple screenings at Sunray Cinema here in town. It's a great little art house cinema, really wonderful people to work with. We did a screening of Return of the Living Dead, and we also did Sleepaway Camp. And then after that, uh, we, we kind of did a little live show after everybody watched the movie. And we invited people from the audience to come up and like answer trivia questions and just play along. And you know, we gave prizes and stuff like that. Andy made some great, really amazing posters for both of those shows. I don't know, I think that our first live event, uh, our Return of the Living Dead live screening that we did at Sunray Cinema in Jacksonville, Florida, that was huge for me because it really, you know, whether or not everybody was there to hear us, which they definitely were not all there for us, or they were there for just the movie, which was a lot of them, people really engaged with us and really, you know, got into our trivia segments, got into all the little things that we added to that. And you know, that was a very scrappy thing that we, we just kind of threw together. We had to. And when I say threw together, I mean worked our asses off to make it as legitimate as possible with no know-how. So <laughs> that was really how that worked. And that was huge for me. You know, I don't get to participate in as many of the live events. I've n I didn't get to do the sleepaway camp. I didn't get to do any of those types of live meetups or shows. And so that's kind of a bummer, but I really do enjoy the Chilloween party because everyone is getting together through Zoom. And so that's really kind of a special event for me because I get to participate as well. Also, uh, just this past year, we did our very first uh, Chilloween party is what we were calling it. It was like a, a, a Zoom Halloween party for all of our patrons. You support us on Patreon at any level. Uh, you, you were invited to the party. We did like costume contests. We played trivia. And we also, uh, we all watched Halloween 2018 together in preparation for Halloween Kills being released. I think Halloween Kills was actually released the night we, we did this party. It was a great time, man. Everybody showed up like dressed to the nines. There were some amazing costumes. I was like, honestly surprised at how, um, how great these costumes were. People like really came through. The trivia was a lot of fun too. I was surprised, like I kind of mixed up the questions. Some of them I never would have known, but I mean, you guys like blew me away at how much horror knowledge you had. It was a lot of fun. Definitely want to do more stuff like that in the future. And also our Joe Bob watch parties. You know, anytime Joe Bob's doing his thing on Friday night, we try to get together and uh, have a little watch party, you know, engage with each other while we watch him do his thing. And it's been a lot of fun sort of growing that over the past few seasons as well. Also too, anytime we have like a 100th episode, uh, we always try to make those special. Our 300th was super big. We died and went to hell and came back. And having Nicole, John and Anthony all kind of collaborate with us on the 300th episode. That was super special and a lot of fun. I think that is one of our best 100th episodes we've ever had. I would say the episode 300, that was our biggest swing we've ever taken in terms of making an episode. You know, we, we tried some stuff on that episode and I, I'm really proud of the results. I think it was a lot of fun, kind of funny. And I think that it paid homage to what we have done fairly well as much homage as it warrants. <laughs> just some like funny moments that have happened on the show over the years. The birth of Red Stag, Randy is one of my favorites. It was our Halloween special of the year. We were talking about Texas Chainsaw 1 and 2. And for some reason, Randy thought it'd be a good idea to buy a bottle of Red Stag, which is disgusting. It's like a cherry whiskey or some shit. And he just started drinking out of the bottle towards the end of the show. And it is hilarious. If you haven't listened to that episode, 
I do recommend that. A lot of the times we sort of measure our time in terms of, you know, in jokes that we make. So things like Halloween Resurrection and the infamous rubber rat squeaking as it's being stabbed or bitten. I can't even remember at this point. Uh, we laughed our asses off at that. Justin in particular. And I really enjoy the supercuts that we do for that, you know, kind of going back and remembering each essentially two years of this podcast, which going on eight years, that's a big deal to kind of have those memories in between. So I really enjoy the supercuts as well. Also, I, I think it was episode like 247 where we finally wrap up the whole uh, how to save a life segment, you know, where I just get. <laughs> shit on for buying way too many movies. Was hilarious, Justin like tallies up how much money I spent on movies over the year, which is probably very incorrect. It was hilarious nonetheless, and I believe that's the same show where we all take a shot of Malort for the first time, which is heinous. I don't recommend trying it, but you should definitely listen to us try it. Uh, that was a really fun moment on the show. Counting down to Bob's jet ski, and that whole year where we tracked Bob's Blu-ray purchases, was one of my favorite moments that kind of reveal could Bob have bought a jet ski? That was also the episode, I believe, where we all took Malort for the first time, took a shot of Malort. And so that episode in particular and that kind of whole year leading up to that was a ton of fun. I think it was special too because we all hadn't seen each other in a long time. That was when Randy was kind of traveling around the country and I had been gone a while. So that was a really special episode for sure. We also uh, did a collaboration with uh, the Short Box podcast. They're another Jacksonville based podcast. They talk about comic books and we wanted to find some sort of crossover between horror and comic books. So we did a live show about Creepshow, uh, both the movie and the comic book. We had the movie playing on the wall. We all just talked about how fucking cool that movie and comic book is. Uh, we had a lot of people engage with us as well. Probably the biggest is that some of our listeners have gone on to tell me and tell us that we helped catalyze them to start their own podcast, which, I mean, to me, there's no you know greater thing that you can, you can do than inspire somebody to create anything, anything of value, even if it's just to them, even if it's just to us. Like, that's, that's the sort of thing that, you know, you create to do. You want to inspire people, you want to you know, make people interested in, in the medium even, and in our really dumb, really roundabout, throwing shit at a wall kind of way, we somehow managed to do that, and that's incredible to me. You've got some bullshit. I got some bullshit. What is this? Oh, Malort. Oh, Malort, indeed. We have here Jepson's Malort Liquor, direct from Chicago, USA, and we are all going to do a shot of this bullshit right here. Yeah. We have all brought liquor from our hometowns. Our hometowns. <laughs> that is, that's that a is huge. That's, that's not mine. That's, not, that's, that's Randy's. Not. No! God, yeah, so that's much. too much. I'm going to spill it. Yeah, it is going to get everywhere. You're going to drink it, and you're going to grow some hair on your chest. I can't move it without <laughs> spilling it. God, Randy. This is fine. I'll drink that one, then. No, you're they're all full. And are unfamiliar with Jepson's Malort, it is notoriously disgusting. Um... There's actually a really funny video of this guy drinking it on YouTube and like getting really, really disgustingly wasted on it, and he pukes. Oh it's god, hilarious! He it's thinks... actually like an ad for Malort. Oh yeah, this, this is what they're known for. They embrace how terrible it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now I get to drink this for the first time. In, uh, not second time for me. Not excited. I'm here to share with you the pain. Okay. Yeah. Right. Are we ready? All right. Yeah. Here we go. Shall we all say Malort? Oh, oh, Lord! Oh, my Lord! Cheers! Cheers. Cheers. Oh, it's spilling! Oh, oh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so gross. <laughs> <laughs> ah! No! We want to keep growing, you know, eventually it would be an incredible pipe dream of a, of a reality if we ever ended up in a situation where even one of us could dedicate our full-time pursuits to this and would legitimize it in that way. I want to sort of just like broaden how we engage with listeners and how we would find new potential listeners. I'd really like to get into more 
live events. I wanna do some more like movie screenings, host trivia. I'd like to table at some conventions. I think now that we are heading toward 400, I think my ultimate, ultimate goal is to make sure we all make it to 500. I don't know, that just seems like a huge, huge, milestone and now that we're getting closer and closer i think that's my ultimate goal for the future probably even more importantly though is i want to keep growing our community i think that you know we've you know start we've got our slack channel where we have i don't know how many people at this point regularly interacting with each other and making friends with each other and starting podcasts with each other and doing all these incredible things just on the backs of us being friends in our own right and i think that's an, a great contagion for us to spread of course, I would love to grow our fan base more in Seoul, in South Korea, where I am personally. I want to have my own kind of live events and to kind of grow the horror community where I live. We've also like, you know, we've grown this wonderful Slack community and there's been a lot of uh, relationships that have blossomed out of that and uh, a lot of creative relationships specifically and people are starting their own shows. So maybe in the future we'll get some sort of like podcast collective or, or something like that going. I think that could be a lot of fun as well. There's a ton of horror shows we don't get to review. There are so many podcasts that are coming out from our Slack that I would love to somehow get involved. And so, yeah, the future is looking bright. Don't worry, I have a ton of ideas. We will keep switching it up for the future. I guarantee that. Guess what everyone fucking needed? Our dumbass Our faces. Dumbass like dumb faces. Ass shit. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll yeah. see how this works out. That's going to do it for this episode of Straight Showing. We're going to be back next week with a brand new episode. If you want to join us on Slack, just hit us up on any one of our social media websites. Um, let us know you want to join us, and I'll send you a link so you can do that. Get in on the fun. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at str8 underscore chilling. We are on Instagram at straight chilling podcast. You can send us an email through our website, straight chilling podcast.com. Uh, and as always, everybody, please keep chilling. We did it. <laughs> <laughs>